Good morning. Good morning. Happy Monday. Good morning. Good morning. Come on in. Come on in. Whew. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Good morning. Come on in. Come on in. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. I'm just going to give it a couple more minutes here. Um, good morning. Happy Monday. Praise God. How many are you excited about another day, another opportunity to be in the land of the living? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. God is so good. He's so merciful. His mercy is new every morning. How many are you just excited about God just renewing our mercies every morning? He's so amazing. He's so, so amazing. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God, praise God, praise God. Praise God, praise God. Can we give it like one more moment? Hallelujah, Jesus. I kind of miss our music having to get set the atmosphere. Hopefully you got your worship already going on this morning. You've already been before the Lord praying, seeking God on your own. Amen, amen, amen. All right, I'm going to go ahead and open this up in prayer. Father God, I thank you, oh, Heavenly Father, oh, merciful God, oh, righteous King, Lord, our Savior, our Advocate, our Redeemer. Lord, we give you glory. We give you adoration. We give you honor for where honor is due, God. And without you, God, we don't know where we would be and don't even want to think about where we could be, God. But Lord, we are so grateful that you are our Savior. You reign over our life. You govern our lives, oh, God. Lord, I thank you right now for being right here in the midst of us right now, God, being in the midst of mornings with the Holy Spirit, God, speaking your word, oh God, using our mouthpieces, God, but teaching it from your, from your throne. And God, I thank you right now that you have your way, that this word is applicable to every life that's listening on this end, on the end of this camera, oh God. Father God, I thank you right now that you take it and you go to another level with it, oh God. You apply it to a whole nother level to everybody where it meets them right where they're at, oh God. Lord, I thank you for God that we should go in and not go off. And I thank you right now for this word, oh God, on this day, releasing the least the man of God. And Lord, I thank you for releasing the woman of God. Lord, I thank you for the focus being on the men this month, oh God, and how they are transforming and converting more and so over to you. And even with the women, God, I thank you right now that you have your way. Speak like you never spoke before, God, through me, all in me, God, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning to the Holy Spirit. Good morning to mornings with the Holy Spirit and everybody who's so faithful to get on here every Monday, every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And now we have Saturdays and Sundays off where you just alone, shut in with the Lord on your own. But we thank God for the faithfulness over the years of those of you who have been with mornings with the Holy Spirit. And those of you who are new, we thank God for you. We thank God for all those who tag and share. We thank God for all those who take the word and not just go off whatever the facilitator is speaking about, but you go and you go dig deep and deeper into the word for yourself to make it applicable to right where God wants it to be for you. I thank God for Elder Latika Wiley for just being obedient to the Holy Spirit, birthing forth the seed that has blessed so many lives. It blesses me every time either I'm on here speaking or whether I'm on here listening. Uh, I thank God for um, Elder Latika Wiley. I thank God for all the facilitators. I thank God for each and every last one of you. So as you know, this is the month of June. This is the last week of June. Praise God. And um, this month we've been, talk we've been talking about um, releasing the man of God and women this applies to you too and so so far this month the word has been powerful for all those I was able to be able to listen to and I still have yet to go back and listen to some so today I want to just jump right on into this word um as I was studying this when we first got this uh 
the mandate of what the month of June was going to be. Um, it's like, wow, God, okay, how do I speak to the man? How do I speak to the heart of where the men are? And only the Holy Spirit knows the heart of people, whether it's a man, gender, woman, gender, only God knows. And so um, in doing this, I'm going to talk about, it made me think about um, my children. All my children were active in sports. And so I don't know when I kept thinking, coming back to study, to ask out who we're going to talk about out of the Bible to represent for the men and the, their life and their breakdown of the story. I just kept hearing God speak about rebound. And so the subtitle of this is go in before going off. So don't lose that because we're going to collaborate all of this in one. We're going to talk about two men out of the Bible and it's going to collectively come together. But the subtitle is go in before going off. So what comes to your mind when you hear someone say go in before going off? Just keep that on your mind as we're going through this. OK, so we're going to talk about rebound as well. So I'm going to first start off with reading the scripture. I'm going to lead with the word um, and I'm going to go from three different books. The first book I'm going to come out of is St. Luke chapter 22, verse uh, 31 and 32. And it reads as this, I'm coming out of the King James Bible. And it says, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that they fail, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brother. So this really stuck out to me to start off with this because this is Jesus speaking to Peter. And so in this, we get so many nuggets out of this because it's Jesus is warning Peter that Satan is going to, that Satan desires him. We know Satan desires each and every last one of us. He does not want us doing anything that belongs to, that has anything to do with the building the kingdom or giving God glory or reading God's word, praying, praising God, worshiping God. He does not want any of that. So he desires to sift every last one of us as we. But the thing about this that got to me was, but I prayed for thee. Jesus prays for us. Jesus is our advocate. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. I'm going to talk about that um, in the scripture. But Jesus prayed for us. Jesus said, right, Peter, Jesus telling Peter, I pray for thee that thy faith faileth not. And when thou art converted. So right there, there's a there's a well, in between there because he's telling him that your faith, he's praying that your faith fail not. But then at the same time, he comes back and says, but when thou art converted. So he knows there's going to be a mishap or a failing or somewhere, somewhere in between. Peter's faith is going to fail. Peter's going to do something that's going to end up denying his relationship with Jesus Christ is going to end up separating him from Jesus Christ it's going to do something that has a separate place. He says, but when thou art converted that, that um, you go and strengthen thy brother, he gave him an order. He gave him a command. He gave him something to go and do. And so with this, I want to just um, bring the men into focus to say that we know the enemy is after the men. We've been seeing that in the beginning of the Bible, how King Herod, tried to kill every young man trying to get after Jesus. And so we see it in the Bible where even Pharaoh, we see it in the Bible where um, how the men would go out to war with the kings. On the, uh, the, you know, the kings would go out almost every spring of the year and go to war with each other. So we know the men are very valuable and they're very price, priceful towards the kingdom of heaven and also towards Satan to, to win dominion. And so we cover our men and women, cover your husbands, cover your sons, cover your cousins, cover your uncles, cover your grandfathers, cover your boyfriends, cover, cover the men in this world, in this nation. They need to be covered. We see how they are fought against day and day in this world, time and time after again, even in the word. So moving forward here, um, rebound. So in this, we're going to talk about a little bit. I'm, okay, I'm going to throw Peter in there just a little bit because I talked about him with how Satan said, how God gave him warning. And so I thought about this when my kids, my, all my kids played um, basketball. And so I thought about this. I remember when they were, used to play basketball and I'd like defense, I'd be screaming defense, defense. And, you know, um, so the uh, defensive, the defense side would go and shoot the ball. And if they miss the ball, you have those that are around the, 
around the basket that's trying to look for the rebound. Or you have that person that's on that player with the ball. They're trying to box them out. They're trying to hold their opponent back from making the basket. So they have, they're boxing them out. They're trying to keep their body in, be in between them and the basket, um, be between the enemy and the basket so they won't make the shot. And so with doing so, they have to, this is, I want to talk about the fundamentals of rebounding, okay? And it's so amazing how God brought this to my attention um, because I saw the kids do it all the time, but I never put thought into it to apply it to my life spiritually. And so one of the things I would hear um, them say in practice or either see my kids put into action when they were playing basketball and rebound, they will always bend their knees. And so in bending their knees, that puts them in position to where they don't have to be stuck or they can move around quickly. They can go back and forth. They can stop. So if you if their opponent is going to the left, they can quickly move to the left with them. If their opponent is going to the right, they can quickly move to the right. Their knees are always bent when they are in the defensive mode to rebound the ball. And so with your knees being bent, let's take it to the spiritual side. God calls us to pray without ceasing. He so with our knees being bent and we have our knees bent all the time, that means that we're coming in between the enemy and what he's going to shoot his aim at and coming in between to block it because our knees are always bent. Go in before going off. Remember that. Go in before going off. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. So our knees are always bent. Our knees are bent because we're praying on our face. We're not trying to seek a fleshly answer. We're not trying to respond in our flesh. We're not trying to respond from our hurt. We're not trying to respond from the pain. We're not, we're not trying to respond from what we see right now. We're trying to respond from where our, from what is being told to us, what's being entailed to us from the kingdom of heaven while we are on our knees being bent. So the the second part of the rebound is that they say, lift your hands. I was, I was screaming this from <laughs> this is my kids. Probably like my mama. Oh my gosh. I like lift your hands, raise your hands up. When I got ready to see them, I'm watching the floor. I'm watching the floor, seeing how these players are moving, where their eyes are going. And a lot of players, you can tell where they're about to throw the ball. If they're going to shoot it because their, their eyes always follow where their hands is about to do a dead giveaway. Be careful. So, just a little nugget. So I will always scream, lift your hands. So the coach will be screaming, lift your hands. And I'll see the kids lift their hands up and they'll be trying to block the ball and, you know, get ready to go. And even the ones that are underneath the basket where the, where the, where the game, where the aim is, they will have their hands lifted up ready to retrieve the or rebound that ball. And so even with doing so with your hands lifted up, with your knees bent and your hands lifted up, let's take it to the spiritual side. That means you're giving God praise through the storm. You're giving God praise through the, through, through the, um, through the pain. You're giving God praise through whatever it is. You're worship him. You're praising because your knees are bent and you're praying and your hands are lifted up. No matter what, God, I'm going to praise you. No matter what it looks like, I'm going to praise you. No matter what I feel like, God, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to seek your face. And I'm going to praise you because at the end of the day, I know you have the last say so. So if your knees are bent and your hands are raised, guess who's going to rebound that ball? You have the rebound. You have the attack over the enemy to rebound that ball. And so no matter which way or no matter which direction the enemy is trying to shoot his shot, it's not going to make the basket because your knees have been bent and your hands have been raised and it's going to bounce off the rim or off the backboard because guess what? You are protected by the number one coach of the world, Jesus Christ himself. And so if your hands are not raised and your knees are not bent, guess what's going to respond? You're going to be discombobulated. You're going to lose focus. You might get distracted with the fan in the um, audience calling out your name. You might get distracted by the tennis shoe being untied. You might get distracted by your player over there. You thinking he out of position because you're not paying attention to your position. And guess what? The ball is shot and is shot and the basket is made. And now guess what? Even with the shot being made. God is so merciful and he's so powerful that he will allow us to get the ball back in possession. So no matter what, because it says the righteous man uh, in Proverbs, I believe it's Proverbs 24. I believe y'all don't quote me on that. But in Proverbs, it says that the righteous man faileth seven times seven. He fails. It tells us that the, the now get this. Now he's telling us that you're righteous. But then at the same time, he tells you that you're going to fail seven times. 
So there's nothing wrong with you making a mistake and you accidentally fall because then it says that the righteous man fails, but he arises, he gets back up. So at the end of the day, when you're in the position of rebounding, you may be in position to rebound. Maybe you didn't lock your knees like you should have not locked, got on your knees that day because you went, was in a rush. And then all of a sudden, here come the adversary shooting one of his arrows, shooting one of his shots, and then it catches you off guard. But guess what? The Bible says you should get back up. So I want you to get back up. I want you to encourage your husband to get back up. He may be dealing with something that may um, he may have been struggling with. And so we're going to talk about this. They're going to jump over to King, Second Kings because I don't want to get too far on myself. Remember, go in before going off. Rebound. Let me tell you about the definition of rebound. The definition of rebound means bounce back. How many of you know we are in a season of bounce back? We have lost some ground. Yes, yes. Come on, come on. How many of you can admit you've lost some ground because of some things you've been letting your flesh get over, over, uh, or supersede over your spiritual? But guess what? You are in the season of a bounce back because the rebound says bounce back through the air after hitting a hard surface or object. And then also it says to recover from a setback or frustration. I don't know about y'all. I didn't have some frustrations. I thank God for a phone call I just got the other day that it was a rebound because I was in position to be able to rebound that thing that I had been praying about. It had been a frustration through the process, but I had to trust God through the process. But I actually got the final call that I needed to know that God was in the midst of working it out. And I was able to rebound that ball where the enemy thought he had that shot and he missed it. And when God allowed me to fall into my hands, I was able to keep it and know how to take care of it from that from that moment on. And so then the second definition is an upward leap or a movement, meaning recovery. The Bible says that you should recover all those things that the canker worm, the liquid worm, and all those things that tried to steal or take from you, the enemy stole from you. You should recover it. Come on, if you got your knees bent and your hands are raised, ooh, let me tell you three, I've got three. Got number three. It also talks about, I remember hearing um, the coaches used to yell, especially at my daughter, Shakita, because she would be like a, like moving and he was scre he was screaming he like plant your feet if your feet are planted your knees are bent your hands are lifted and your feet are planted planted what in the word of god planted what in the ministry that you belong to not one foot in and one foot out planted what in your home planted what in your marriage planted where in your relationship with your children planted where if you are planted on the things that god has gave you and handed over to you that he has ordained for you then you will not have to worry about losing ground for those things because you are planted on those things but if you only have one foot on and one foot off, it's easy for the enemy to come and shake it and pull it from you. And another thing is to turn this to a spiritual realm. I want you to stump your feet on the on the neck of alcohol. Stump your feet on the neck of anger. Stump your feet on the neck of frustration. Stump your feet on the neck of st stress. Plant your feet on the word. Plant your feet right there on the neck of that very thing that has you discombobulated, you're struggling with. Stump your feet dead on his neck and crush and say, you will not have no more ground, no more room in my life because my knees are bent, my hands are raised, and I am planted in the word of God. And I'm planted in his promises. So stump your feet right on that very thing that you want God to deliver you from. That very thing, man of God, release the man of God. Come on, acknowledge the things that you know you struggle with. You ain't got to acknowledge those things out in the open in front of your wife or your homeboy or the church. You can go right before God and speak to him and say, Lord, here it is. You know what I struggle with behind closed doors. Let's talk about naming. Let's go to Second Kings. I believe it was chapter five. Hold on, y'all. Where is my glasses? Sorry, y'all. Wait a minute. I can't see. Okay, Second Kings, chapter five. Naaman was a um. Naaman was a man who was a cat. He was a captain of the host of an army, right? And so he has great, he had great prestige. He was considered to be a great man. And so with Naaman, um, he also was a leper 
Nobody really knew about this because back in those days to have leprosy was like to be condemned it means you were outcasted like the woman with the issue of blood. She was outcasted. Anybody who had leprosy lived outside of the grounds of the city. They were not allowed to be able to facilitate and live within the boundaries of the city because they were considered to be sinful. They were considered to be dirty and nasty disease. So to have leprosy means that you were outcast. But we see Naaman is a great soldier. It says in verse one, now Naaman captain of the host of the king of Syria was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor but he was a leper. Now when I read this I said my God because on the outside he was being praised in the public he was being praised but in private Naaman was in pain. So there's a lot of us that in the outside in the public, we're being praised. They're being praised for what they see. They're being You're being praised for what you do. You might be at work and getting bonuses and praise. Oh, you do such an awesome job. Or you might be a mother and be like, oh, you, mom, you're so great because you cooked this dinner. You bought me those shoes. Or you could be a father. Dad, you're so great. You showed up at my game today. You bought all the team snacks or whatever. But they don't see the pain that you're going through behind closed doors. They don't see the pain that's going on inside internally. Naaman was a great man of valor. The Bible just said it. The Lord handed him over Syria, but even this is the part that got to me because even his king knew he was a leper. So even the king covered it up. Why? Because of what Amon was able to do for him. So many times people will pat you on your back and you'll be bleeding spiritually, wounded spiritually, hurt spiritually, just tired, ready to throw in the towel spiritually, all of the above, and they'll pat you on your back because you're able to collect a large offering because you just spoke at a church or you're able to come and heal, uh, speak a word and people listen to you or they, or they pat you on your back because you're able to bring that quota in for the job or they're able, you're able to win that account or you're able to, whatever it is, they come and pat you on your back. They don't think about, they don't care about what you're going through. It's about all what you can do for them. So to, for the king to be able to cover up the fact that he was a leper, if he was to even got wind of, anybody would have got wind of that, what a mockery that would have made. And so moving on to this, um, it talks about, um, we're going to go to verse eight. So actually, we're going to go back up. Let me go back to clarify that the king knew. And so, um, Let's go to verse two. And Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel, a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. So, and she said unto her mistress, would God, my Lord, were, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, thus, thus said the, what the maid had said. And so the king of Syria said, go to and go. And I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. So even the king agreed for Naaman to go. And he would send a letter to the king that the king would get the name and healed of his leprosy. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel saying, now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of leprosy. So the king began to rent his clothes. and like, you know, I'm not one who can bring healing. Are you trying to cause a quarrel between us to bring me a letter to ask me to heal this man of leprosy? I have no power to do so. So now the king is renting his clothes and he's upset. And he's mad. And he's thinking that the other king is doing this to cause quarrel between the two kings. And so then Elisha hears of this. And he sends a message to the king and says, tell Naaman to come to me. So then Naaman goes with his chariots, with his talents, his, his money, his, uh, his gifts he's going to bring. Because now Naaman in his mind thinks he can buy this healing. And so many times we think that we can get what God wants, what we want from God on our own terms, but it's not that way. So many times we find ourselves being our own God and not God himself. And so we get in the way of what God has called us to do. And so, so many times we think that we can um, persuade our way into something that God says, no, there's a process for this thing. And you either go through the process or you won't get what I got for you. And so to make a long story short, here goes Naaman. He goes to Elisha. But Elisha doesn't come out to meet Naaman. And so Elisha sends his servant. So we're on verse eight. 
And it says, and so, and it was so when Elijah, the man of God, had heard the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Elijah sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee. Thou shalt be clean. So Elijah didn't come and meet with Naaman. He sent his messenger and said, Go tell Naaman to go wash in the Jordan River seven times and then his flesh will become clean remember i said go in before going off right this is what naaman's response is but naaman was wroth meaning in a different translation it says naaman was so angry and he left and he said behold i thought how many times have we said something god give us instructions and we said well i thought our thoughts are not his thoughts. Amen. And it said, I thought he should surely come out to me. Now, name is like, wait a minute. I'm this big guy. I'm this great man of valor. You know, he not even come out to meet me. And he said, and then stand and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Now, how dare name and tell Elisha how God is supposed to do his healing? Now, he's the one that needs to be healed, but yet we come with our own terms on how we expect our healing to take place or how we expect that blessing to show up, how we expect God to do what he said in his word to show up on our own terms. And then he even went to the place to where, because Jordan was one of the nastiest rivers there was in that area. He said, are not Abana and Prophet of the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. Go in before going off. You don't know why God has, has you in the place that you're in or why that person's saying what they're saying to you because it's a part of the process of what you've been praying for. And we are so quick to go off without going in to hear what the instructions really are from God. We allow our inner man, we allow our inner self to ruin what it is, to cause a delay in the process of what God is saying to us. So Naaman's upset. He goes, now how dare you tell the, the prophet which river that you should go dump yourself in. You need the healing. Now you're dealing with leprosy. Leprosy is like a sin that kills within. Leprosy is something that kills the skin. It's painful. It just eats away and corrupts the skin. Now you're going to be that picky to say, I don't want to dump my, go to Jordan River and dump myself in there seven times, but I'll go to a clean river and do it. But you'd rather deal with that leprosy. How prideful people can be. How prideful I can be, how prideful you can be in the process of what God has called us to for our healing. And so then his servants came to him and just bed with him and talked to him and said, Naaman, you know, um, on verse 13, it says, my father, the prophet had bid thee to do something great thing. What does not have done it? How much rather than when he said to thee, wash and be clean. So now Naaman's thinking about it like, OK, I guess they're right. Because he's coming with this big entourage of people. He's a great man of valor. So he's a big entourage of people watching and looking at him. And so then he went down and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. He dipped himself. And so when I saw that, I thought about that song back in the day where it says, when I dip, you dip, you dip, put your hands. What was it? Like, put your hands on your hip. When you dip, I dip, we dip. Come on, men of God. If you are over your household and you have a husband, you have a family underneath you and you're you're governing over them and God has given you dominion over your wife with your wife and your children and you're running a household. When you dip, they dip. We dip. We all dip together. If you are a son, when you dip, we dip. We dip. When if you're an uncle, when you dip, we dip. We dip. We all dip together. So no matter what you're going through, you're not going through it alone, because when you dip, we dip. We all going to dip. And so when this passage of scriptures goes through, it says that he dipped it seven times according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. He all he had to do was go dip in that dirty water. Sometimes God will make us go deal with that dirty, dirty. Sometimes we, we don't want to face it because it's been so dirty and we don't want to realize what's going on with it. We don't want to we don't want to recall the pain. We don't want to recall the memories. We don't want to recall and relive it all over again. But sometimes God will make you go back into that dirty water and make you go dip into that dirty water to remind you where he's bringing you from. Just to see if you'll be obedient enough to go and be to hear what he's got to say, because guess what? It wasn't about the outer. 
It was about what God was trying to do in the inner of his faith for him. God was trying to show Naaman, it's all about your faith. It's not about your skin. It's about what's inside of you, Naaman, that pride, that hurt, that hidden secrets, the hidden pain. Could you imagine going home at night fighting all these many men and winning all these different wars and you're going home in pain, your skin is falling off and it's peeling and nobody knows but a couple people and there's nothing they can do for you. Those struggles that nobody knows about that you deal with on a daily Naaman did, but he finally came to himself. He humbled himself to go back into that dirty water of the Jordan. He dipped seven times. What if God is calling you to dip seven times? He's calling you to dip into that word seven days a week. He's calling you to dip into his worship seven days a week. And for you to see the prophecy to come forth out of your life, for him, for you to see what God has promised for you out of your life. It may not look comfortable. It may not feel comfortable. It may not be what you want to do. You may feel like you're being ridiculed or embarrassed, but so what? At the end, your greater shall be latter than your former. If you allow God to do what he's going to do for you in your life and just be obedient to what his instructions is, you will see the results of the kingdom of God all over you and your family. I want to go here because it says go in before going off. Naaman decided to go off before he even decided to go in. He went off two different directions. He went off by his mouth and he went off by his direction of where God was leading him. Instead of he left. So God sent him to Israel so he could get healed, but he decided to leave. How many times have God sent you to a place? He sent you to a church. He sent you to that job or he sent you to that that gentleman or that woman so they could feed into you. They can they can um, help nurture you. They can help uh, strengthen you. Iron sharpens iron. But you left. But before you left, you let your mouth go off because you didn't like what they were saying. You didn't like how they were digging in your business. You didn't like how they were reading you the truth. You didn't like how they were telling you about yourself where you had to get to that place where you really need to be delivered because that thing that they saw that God allowed them to see that was keeping you was what God was trying to get to, but yet you want to talk about this, but God's trying to talk about that thing that's like this, that only he knows that you want to keep a secret. Go in before going off. Rebound. There are so many things in our life that have been shot and even shots that we've taken that we've missed shots. We've taken with our children that we've missed and we need to rebound the ball because we might have went off before going in. There's so many shots that we could have missed with our husbands or our, our wives that we shot the ball, shot our shot. And we didn't do as, exactly everything that God said to do. So we missed the basket. We missed the target. So now we got to rebound because we don't want to go off. We want to go in. Because guess what? I've learned this over the years, y'all. And this is told to be true. That if I go, you know, you can Google everything now. And say, for instance, I want my plumbing is leaking and I can Google how to fix this pipe under my sink. I can go in there and fix the pipe under the sink. And if I mess it up, guess what I can do? Call a plumber to fix it. But sometimes, majority of the time, 80% of the time, 90% of the time, it's really hard to go undo when you hurt someone. It's really hard to go undo when you brought this person's pain, when you've said some things to this person that's broken their spirit, when you said some things to this person that may have been lies or you may have spread gossip or whatever about this person. It's really kind of, sometimes it's kind of hard to undo. It's going to take God to step in to rebound that one, to come into the place to get the healing to take place for that individual. So it's so much easier to go in, to stay on your knees, have your knees bent, have your hands raised and have your feet planted so you don't have to go try to undo what God is trying to do. Amen. And so I want to go to this last scripture and um, it is Acts 7 and 5. I just want to encourage you this morning because I mean, I read this the other day. I was in my study time and I read this. I said, oh, I got to share this with mornings with the Holy Spirit. Um, Acts chapter 7, verse 5. And do you not know when you are obedient to what God has called you to do? The scripture, I see so many scriptures talking about how God, it talks about how Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father. The Lord is sitting on the right hand of the Father. The Son of God is sitting on the right hand of the Father. I see that all the time. But this particular scripture stood out to me and God began to minister. We're going to go to Acts chapter 7, verse 54. Through 60. We're talking about Stephen now. Stephen was a great man of God. He was the first martyr 
person to get murdered under the name persecuted for Jesus Christ's sake. He was speaking to the um the Jewish synagogue about how evil the evil intent the sin that they had going on in there. And those men were wrath. I mean, they were so mad at Stephen. They kicked him out of the city and they began to stone him. And so starting at verse 54 says, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into the heavens and saw the glory of God, Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Usually the scripture says Jesus is sitting on the right hand of God. This particular scripture, Stephen saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, behold, I see the heavens open and the son of man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at young man's feet, whose name was Solomon. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And so that reminded me of when Jesus said, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. And so instead of Jesus sitting on the right hand of God, God, I, I, I just, and this, this is nowhere in the scripture, y'all. This is what I got from this. And you can study this for yourself. But when I heard this, and I read this, I began to see Jesus like stand up like he was crying out for his, for his servant. And he stood up as a standing ovation because Stephen did not go off. He stayed in. He went in when the presence of the Lord, he was full of the Holy Spirit and he cried out. He was in the midst of being stoned to death, rocks being thrown at his head, his face, his body. He's being belted, blood splattering. And yet and still, he's not going off on the people. He's not saying, I'm going to get you. I'm not trying to fight. He wasn't trying to fight them back or anything. He stood there and they said he kneeled and he began to pray for those people. He said, Lord, forgive them. Hold not that sin to their charge. Jesus stood up. He saw Stephen being so faithful to him. He saw Stephen being obedient to his word. He wasn't no longer sitting next to his father. He stood up to look at his servant and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. He saw Stephen as an advocate. So when I saw this, I thought about when you sit and we think about Jesus being judge and advocate. So usually when you go into a courtroom, you're sitting down before the, the judge is sitting down before you and you're usually standing up before him. But when I saw this and I saw Jesus standing up, I said how Jesus was standing there advocating for his servant like you get ready to come home because your job as well he was no longer sitting can you can you let your life glorify god so well that he stands up for you and says that's my child down there that's my son that's my daughter that's my servant that's my teacher. That's my advantage. That's my prophet. That's my pastor. That's my that's my cleaning lady. That's my that's my greeter. That's my usher. He stood up for Stephen. You may not have the power to see him standing up in the heavens like Peter did, or like you like uh, Stephen did, or like any of the other prophets in the Bible. But you can feel it in your heart when the peace of God comes all over you. Know God is standing up for you because He has your back because you're being obedient to what He's called you to do. My God, when I read that, that just broke my heart because I said all the times I've read the Bible, I never stood. This never stood out to me. I want to be the woman of God or the man of God that God stands up for me. He says, that's my child. When you he hears your voice, he said, I know that voice. What is she calling on me for? Because she only calls me when there's something going on. She doesn't call me with her hands out. She only calls me when she needs me to go to battle. I want to be that. I want to be that one where God, Jesus stands up. and He advocates for me. Even if I fall short, he says, you know what? God, remember what she did about three hours ago, how she went in that store and she witnessed to that person on aisle five. Remember how he went and worked two jobs to take care of his family, to feed them, and he had sleepless nights, but he always came and got in his word on his lunch break. He went to the car and got in his word, Lord, to spend time with us. He went home, and even though he was tired, he made it to his kids' basketball games, football games, or he sat there and ate dinner with them at the table and read the did Bible studies. Can God stand up for you when he sees you being persecuted, or when he sees things coming against you because of Jesus Christ's sake. Come on, my God. God is so awesome and mighty in our life that he wants to do that for us today. He's so amazing. He's so amazing. So to sum this all up, go in and not go off. Go in before going off. So many times our mouth will go off and we'll mess up what God is saying. We'll mess up what God is trying to do. 
Go in before going off. Get on your knees. Do Be in position for rebounding at all times. If you don't have the ball in your hand, you know the ball is somebody's in somebody's hand. And if it's your husband's, if it's your wife's, if it, the ball is in your husband's hand and he misses the shot, you better be in position to rebound the ball and throw it right back to him so he can make the shot again. If, it's your, if you don't have a husband, you're a single mama and your kids are trying to live the best they can in their life and they so happen to shoot the ball and it's the wrong shot, you better be in position to rebound that ball and shoot that and give that ball, pass that ball right back to your son or your daughter so they can shoot the ball again. We have to be in position, y'all. Our knees need to be bent. Our hands need to be raised. Our feet need to be planted and the things that God called for us so that we can go in before going off. Going off with our mouth and going off into a different direction that causes a delay for us to have to come back and start at the pinnacle point that we messed up at. Go in before going off. That's all I have to say today. I want to encourage you all that it's okay if you fall. But the Bible says that we shall fall, but we shall rise again. We don't stay down. We're not made to stay down. We're made to get up. And if I, if you have a man, a husband, a son, or a father, or an uncle, or somebody in your life that you have not talked to in a while, or that you have not prayed over in a while, I want you to take today. And every day, therefore, after and pray and cover these men, cover them in the box, cover them like never before. Don't cover them out of uh, frustration or out of your hurt feelings. Cover them from the point of God. Point, cover them from the place where God sees them at. Cover them from the place of they are a soul. They need to be saved and set free. Cover them from a place of deliverance because we all have been there. We all need God's mercy. We all need God's grace. We all use it every day, all day. Amen. So go to that place where you can go and pray and seek God and love on them to bring them out of that place. They may not be where you want them to be. It's okay because it's not about us. It's about God. Remember I said, name is an odd thought. Our thoughts are not God's thoughts. But if we stay on our knees, we can see the things that God sees and he'll show it to us because there's no mysteries with God. He'll show it to us if you have a relationship with him. Amen. If there's anybody that needs to say that doesn't know God as their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray today that they will get you a sub Jesus Christ into your life. All you have to do is say, Lord, forgive me. I accept you into our life. My life, Lord, to be my Lord and Savior. I believe that you died on the cross for me and my sins. I believe that you um, died on the cross and you were raised again, Lord, that you came for me, that you did it for me, Lord. And I want you to take over my life and have your way and just make that commitment. Like Damon, like Damon had to dip seven times. Get in that word seven times, seven times a, a week, every day. If you do it once a day, before you know, you start doing it twice a day. Before you know, you be in the word for three or four hours a day. Start it's only seven days in a week, right? So do it every day for seven days of the week. So that means before you know, you did it for the whole month, because every week is seven days. So don't even think about okay, this day eight, this day nine, day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Monday through Sunday, just be in your word. Going to praise, going to worship, and watch how God is going to shift your life. Watch how God is going to shift those things you may be struggling with that you don't want to share with nobody. You can give to God and He'll do it for you. Amen. Father God, I thank you for everybody that's on this live on tonight, God, on this morning, oh God. And I thank you for those who will watch it later. God, I thank you right now that you will begin to tame us, oh God, to the way of direction we will have us to go. God, forgive us for going off, oh God, before going in. God, forgive us, oh God, that you will bring us back to the people that we may have went off on, or oh God, that, that we may need to go back and undo some things that we have done that was not supposed supposed to be done. God, I thank you for the healing taking place. Encourage our men today, oh God. We plead the blood over them, God. We bind up the stereotypes, oh God, of our black men, oh God. We bind up the stereotypes of all men, oh God. We thank you right now that they'll be strong and courageous in you. They'll be like Naaman, that mighty man of valor, oh God. But God, I thank you that they'll be like Naaman to go and dip into that dirty Jordan water and they'll begin to let their flesh become clean. Those things they deal with, those peak shows they have in the middle of the night, God, they'll begin to give those things to you, God, that they will no longer be susceptible to the things of the enemy, God, that when the enemy tries to shoot his, his shot, God, he misses because they've been on their knees and their hands are lifted up and they're praying, God. They will be able to rebound that ball and shoot the shot the way you called the shot to be shot to their destiny, God. Dip them into their destiny, oh God. In the name of Jesus, we give you the glory, we give you the praise and the honor on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Happy Monday. See you tomorrow, Tuesday. Have a great day. Don't forget, when we dip, we when you dip, I dip, we all dip. Amen. So encourage your men today. Encourage somebody that you haven't talked to today that's a man or a woman, whoever it is. Just encourage them today. Amen. 
God bless you.